tonight on UCSD Conversations, learn more about ergonomics and see how to minimize workplace injuries by using the proper tools and techniques. And Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Professor Jeff Beta and UCSD's Jim Cleaves commemorate the 50th anniversary of the historic Miller-Urey experiment, a watershed in the study of origins of life and then follow along as UCSD students bring the arts into public schools. But first, we begin with Hassan Kayali, the director of the Middle East Studies program at UCSD. Tonight, it's Kayali's work on the history of foreign intervention in Iraq that caught the attention of guest host Michael Bernstein. Hello, and welcome to UCSD Conversations. I'm Michael Bernstein, professor of history and associated faculty member in economics here at the University of California, San Diego. I'm delighted to introduce as my guest, Hassan Kayali, associate professor of history and director of the Middle East Studies program on the campus. A specialist on the modern history of the Middle East, Hassan received his PhD from Harvard University in 1988. He was an assistant professor at MIT before joining the UCSD faculty in 1990. Hassan has held several fellowships and grants from, among others, the American Research Institute in Turkey, Cambridge University, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Social Science Research Council. He has also been honored with the award of a University of California President's Fellowship in the Humanities and of a Hellman Fellowship here at UCSD. A gifted track and field star while an undergraduate, Hassan, contrary to many rumors, never managed to run a sub four minute mile. Welcome, Hassan. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Uh, the United States is now involved in playing a major role in the reconstruction of Iraq in the Middle East, uh, and in this respect is thus involved in nation building. Ironically enough, Iraq itself was the product of a great experiment in nation building in the early 20th century. And I thought we might begin by talking a bit about your knowledge of the history of this uh, experimental beginnings of the Iraqi state. Indeed. Um, there's a lot of talk these days, uh, a lot of comparisons between the U.S. Uh, experience in nation building in, uh, in various parts of the world, uh, particularly in Germany and Japan, uh, maybe Bosnia. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, there's very little said about this uh, other uh, nation-building experiment in Iraq itself. And that indeed is a very recent uh, experiment. Uh, one thing that is often forgotten is how young uh, a country Iraq is. Um, um, octogenarians in, 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 in the Middle East today, including in Iraq, were born in a different country, in the Ottoman Empire. So Iraq came to existence in the 1920s, um, in the aftermath of World War I, uh, and it was um, an artificial uh, creation. Um, the, uh, not just Iraq, but the other uh, uh, Arab countries in the Fertile Crescent, uh, uh, all the way from the Mediterranean to the uh, Indian uh, Ocean there. Uh, and uh, Iraq was designated as a League of Nations mandate, um, uh, and that was consistent uh, with, um, uh, with uh, Britain's uh, needs to dominate an entire swath of territory all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. But previously, this whole region had been dominated by one power, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire. Surely, correct? there were in the Middle East uh, two sovereign states, Iran and the Ottoman Empire only two sovereign states until you could say the 1920s. So World War I destroyed? World War I destroyed the, the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. Empire. The Ottomans were on the losing side of the war together with the Central Powers and the fate of the Middle East was uh, determined in, uh, in European councils. Uh, the irony here is that uh, the Arabs actually revolted against uh, the Ottoman state, against the Ottoman Sultan, and cooperated uh, with uh, uh, Britain and France. Uh, uh, in return, uh, it, they were promised uh, a, 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 an extensive uh, unified Arab state in that region. But uh, that was not uh, to happen because of the uh, various uh, economic and strategic interests of 
Britain and France. So Britain and France divided the area uh, uh, between themselves, uh, with Iraq having been designated an area of uh, British influence and British control more than influence. And, and in uh, the designation of the contours of the boundaries of uh, that new entity, Iraq, Iraq in itself is a fairly uh, recent uh, term. Uh, the Ottomans hardly ever referred to the region as Iraq. Um, and uh, the, the three Ottoman provinces of Mosul, Baghdad, um, and Basra were put together to constitute this new, uh, uh, this new state of, uh, uh, of Iraq. Now, um, in that sense, actually, Iraq is less of an artificial creation because uh, the, compared with the other uh, Arab areas. If you look at Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, um, uh, the, 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 the drawing of the boundaries is even more anarchic. Uh, but uh, these three provinces did not really constitute a whole uh, within the Ottoman system. In fact, Mosul was always tied to Asia Minor and to Anatolia, uh, whereas Baghdad and Basra looked southward to the Look Persian to the Gulf. Um, so these three Ottoman provinces constituted the new state of Iraq. And the British brought uh, a, a ruler from outside of Iraq, uh, and, and, um, and, and brought it to the throne of a new uh, Iraqi uh, kingdom um, and, um, and, and proceeded uh, to form certain institutions according with the uh, requirements of the mandate that, not, that they now held. Was there great resistance to the creation of this monarch uh, from the outside? By the well, there was great resistance to the establishment of a mandate. In 1920, there was a major revolt, for instance, uh, and you know, about 10,000 Iraqis died. Uh, now, there's a real history of Iraqis rising in protest, and perhaps 1920 is the very first one. Uh, so uh, the British manipulated the coronation of, uh, of, 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 of King Faisal, the, the, the Hashemite king who was brought from uh, from the Hejaz uh, in, in, in Western Arabia to, to Iraq, uh, it was all very well manipulated. But nevertheless, of course, there were those uh, uh, who felt that um, you know, they, had more, uh, they had more of a legitimate right uh, to lead this uh, new country, and they, had somehow, uh, and they somehow had to be um, uh, neutralized. Um, so it was a, a, a foreign uh, and an outsider uh, uh, placed um, in charge of this uh, Iraqi state. Um, and um, that was an uncomfortable situation uh, for everyone, uh, although uh, the British uh, proceeded to grant formal independence to Iraq uh, fairly early on. And there had been some uh, in what had previously been these Ottoman provinces uh, who had worked with the British, essentially, in, in opposition to British, to British rule. How did they fit into this? Uh I'm sorry, in opposition to Ottoman rule. How did they fit into this, uh, this constellation of political forces at the time of independence? Well, you, you mean Iraqi forces that had, well... Tried uh, to resist the Ottoman control. Uh, a lot of the Arab officers uh, who, for instance, participated in this Arab revolt led by, uh, uh, by uh, King, uh, King Faisal uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, King Hussein and his sons, uh, uh, Faisal and Abdullah, a lot of the officers were actually from, uh, from Iraq uh, because the Ottomans had a tradition of, um, uh, of, of sending um, uh, the sort of promising youth of uh, Iraq uh, or of, the, of that uh, broader region, particularly Baghdad, to the military academies in Istanbul. Uh, so they cooperated uh, uh, with T. Lawrence and with, uh, uh, with Faisal. Uh, and that cooperation very much continued uh, into Through the mandate period. Mm -hmm. Indeed, that is really uh, sort of the, the, the pivot of, uh, uh, of British administration uh, in, in, in Iraq. Uh, and, and a number of former Iraqi officers who now 
um, you know, acquired um, added privileges under the protection of uh, the British. Uh, they became major landowners. Uh, and they also developed an interest in uh, a sort of a particular Iraqi state as opposed to this broader uh, Arab ideal uh, that had been uh, what all Arabs uh, were uh, waiting for. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's fast forward a bit towards the, the World War II era and beyond. We now have Iraq for the first time as an independent nation mm -hmm. state. Uh, uh, born of this, uh, if you will, British experiment in state building. What happens with the results of the World War II conflict, the defeat of, uh, the defeat of uh, German interests uh, in Europe and in this region, and in the uh, Cold War era? What yes. happens to this nation? Well, as I said, um, you know, independence came early in 1932, but this was not full independence. And this is something, again, uh, that should be kept in mind. The British maintained uh, the right to use air bases. The British maintained uh, the right uh, for the defense of Iraq. The British maintained oil concessions, other economic concessions, even though politically uh, Iraq was independent and a member of the League of Nations after uh, uh, 1932. In 1941, there was a lot of uh, pro-access, pro-German sentiment uh, in the Arab world. To in resist general. the British control. To resist the British control, because there was a lot of resentment mm -hmm. with British and French control. And when the British and the French entered the war against Germany, there was a lot of pro-German sentiment. Uh, and that uh, some pro-German uh, officers, younger officers, uh, affected a coup in 1941. And that coup became the excuse for the British to reinvade uh, Iraq, where they stayed until about uh, 1945. And uh, when the uh, British went back, um, uh, the same uh, ruling elite from the uh, pre-war period, uh, that is these Ottoman officers who had now become a kind of an aristocratic uh, uh, group, uh, continued to rule. Uh, and um, in the 50s, Iraq was uh, assiduously brought into the sort of Western uh, alliance system. Uh, All part of the Cold War, as reframing of, of the world, the uh, splitting between the Soviet Union and the United States. Very much so. Uh, in fact, you could even argue Iraq brought the, uh, the, the Soviet Union into the Middle East. Uh, it was very important for... Um, uh, for the Western alliance uh, to bring uh, Iraq um, uh, together with Iran and, uh, and Turkey, who had already uh, thrown in their lots with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the United States, uh, to, to bring Iraq into this uh, alliance uh, system, and then from there to sort of uh, to, to bring the rest of the uh, Arab countries. But that backfired, because this was also the time when, um, uh, when um, socialist ideologies uh, such as Ba'athism and uh, Nasserism uh, uh, were on the rise, uh, and uh, particularly under Egypt's President Nasser, uh, uh, the, um, the non-alignment uh, became a very uh, strong force uh, in the Arab now, Middle East. Now, Ba'athism, uh, this was a, a left-leaning political movement unique to Iraq, or was it generalized throughout the region? This is the political party, of course, that Saddam Hussein eventually That's right. uh, came to After uh, many lead. reincarnations. Yes. Uh, Ba'ath is uh, a, a political movement and, and a, political, a political party that has its beginnings in the uh, early 40s. Uh, but it became a viable political party first in Syria uh, and then uh, uh, much later on uh, in Iraq. It was um, uh, Ba'athism had a lot of commonalities with uh, socialism, but uh, it also had um, uh, Ba'athism incorporated uh, Islam, uh, viewed Islam as a cultural element that was um, that was uh, central uh, to the Arab Middle East, and that's interesting because the ideologues, at least one of the main ideologues of Ba'athism, Michel Aflaq, uh, was a Christian. Uh, and, 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 ba and, and perhaps the most, imp this, uh, most important feature of Ba'athism was its uh, demand its, uh, for its emphasis on Arab unity. 
So even you know these uh, when uh, the Ba'ath Party was constituted in different uh, uh, in different countries, uh, they were referred to as the Iraqi branch, as this branch, that branch. You know the, the, the suggestion being that there could only be, be one Ba'ath Party and one Arab state. But so, but but Ba'ath goes through, as you said, uh, a number of reincarnations, leading eventually to. Uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, leadership. What, what are the circumstances surrounding those changes? Well, uh, there is there is another episode in I Iraqi history uh, before the, the the rise of Ba'ath to power. Uh, in, in 1958, finally, uh, in this sort of context of the Cold War, which also set off an, an, a, what is often referred to as an Arab Cold War between the monarchies and the more radical states, namely Egypt and Syria on the one side, and Iraq, Jordan. And, and, and Saudi Arabia on the other. Uh, in, in, in 1958, uh, the uh, monarchy was toppled uh, with yet another coup, uh, a coup uh, that was uh, implemented by, uh, the, uh, by the army. And the strongman of the new Iraq in 1958, and this is referred to as the 1958 revolution, was uh, Abdul Karim Qasim, who is known uh, uh, to have been a communist. Uh, and indeed, um, there was a coup against him, against, again coming from the military with support uh, from civilian elements, uh, in which the Ba'athists uh, play, played some role, but not the exclusive role. Indeed, the government that uh, succeeded uh, uh, Qasem's government uh, were not really um, uh, Ba'athi governments. And, and so the conclusion of this process with, with Hussein coming into power, when, yes, when does Hussein, that happen? Yes, Hussein was uh, very much involved. At, and, uh, and As a military officer. No, no. The, Hussein oh. was never in the military. Oh. This is one of the ironies. of uh, We're used to, um, in the Middle East, uh, military uh, you know, generals taking power and then ruling as civilians. Uh, we have the we opposite, have the opposite. Uh, in Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein did not have military training, uh, but he was, um, a, a, he was politically active. He opposed, um, uh, at least towards the end, he opposed the Qasem government, and, and, and there seems to be some evidence that he was part of a conspiracy, uh, perhaps a conspiracy known to the American government, uh, to topple uh, Abdul Karim Qasem. Uh, so uh, Saddam uh, came to be known uh, um, in Iraq in the context of that, um, that, that, that coup against Qasem. But he was not influential in the first couple of governments that were formed. Only after about um, 1968, um, uh, a, a military, a, 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 an officer uh, from uh, Saddam's hometown, uh, Tikrit, um, carried out a yet another coup and came to power, and he was a Ba'athist, um, uh, Hassan al-Bakr. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Saddam Hussein started uh, sort of rising, rising at that point. Uh, at that point. Well, uh, so we have then the, the double irony, I guess we, we, we need to conclude on this point. We then have the double irony that uh, the United States, uh, earlier governments uh, some decades ago, may have played a significant role in the eventual accession, accession to power of Saddam Hussein, and the British, now the American allies in the concluding war in Iraq, played a central role, of course, in creating this nation state decades ago in the, in the early 20th century. Well, Hassan Kayali, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your expertise today. Thank you. Coming up later on UCSD Conversations, a look back 50 years at one of the most influential science experiments ever conducted. And UCSD students bring together public school children and the arts. But now, Daphne Thong of UCSD's Environment, Health and Safety Office helps people work healthier by using ergonomics to minimize musculoskeletal disorder. UCSD ergonomics program comprises of uh, looking at the 
the task itself, trying to identify what are some of the ergonomic risk factor in that particular task, and reviewing the, uh, the employee's work habits and the posture, how the person's engaged in performing those tasks. And lastly, looking at the work environment or the workstation, looking at the kind of tools the person's using to do those tasks, and coming up with uh, solutions to help in reducing pain and improving comfort at the workplace. When EHS Ergonomic Evaluator goes out, uh, there are several things that we look at. One is looking at the task and seeing what kind of ergonomic risk factors are involved in those tasks. Hi, Allison. <laughs> Denise. Nice meeting you. Thanks Health for coming. Safety. Nice meeting you. Okay. Today we wanted to uh, look at your workstation, find out what's going on here. I sit at the computer and on the phone all day. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of all day, could you break it down, let's say, like a percent of time on the computer? Uh, 90. 90. Okay. Phone time? Are you doing phone at the same time as computer? A lot of times I am. Okay. But I, yeah, I'd say about 10, 15 percent on the phone. Okay. And then looking at the person as far as how the person's engaging in that particular task, uh, work habits and uh, awareness of how they're engaging in that, doing that particular task is important. Okay. The biggest problem I'm having is, um, is with my right hand and arm. Um, okay. My whole right pinky goes numb within five minutes of typing. Okay. So I have to, I've been learning to take breaks. Um, and then up my arm, um, by the end of the day, if I'm doing a lot of typing, it just basically goes numb. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the whole pinky will tingle. And then my arm's sore and it goes up to my neck and so forth. Oh, okay. And then lastly, we look at the, the workstation or the environment itself, see what kind of tools are already there. So if there are additional tools or products that can help in uh, facilitating or helping the employee do the job better, then those are uh, suggested as well. Uh, but we often like to uh, look at it in three folds, is the task, the, uh, how the person's doing the task, and his or her, and her ability to understand the good body mechanics when engaging those tasks, as well as providing the proper products and tools. Well, first of all, uh, acknowledge that you're having the pain and uh, kind of monitor as to how often you're getting the pain and what kind of uh, work is triggering the pain. And take action. Oftentimes people let it uh, lapse for a while thinking, well, it'll go away, it'll subside, and then uh, don't do anything about it. What we like to do with, um, with our program is that we want to make sure people reduce the severity of the pain by taking action on the onset of the pain rather than waiting too long. When you're setting up at a computer workstation, a few rules of thumb you want to be aware of is making sure that your head angle is straight and that you're able to look at the top third of the screen either at or slightly below eye level. You also want to make sure that you're about an arm distance away from your monitor. If you have a larger screen, you can go a little farther back. A smaller screen or visual challenges may cause you to bring that back uh, closer to you. You want your shoulders nice and relaxed and your elbows somewhere in the 90 to 110 degree range. Straight wrists and when you're working on a keyboard you want to float over the keys and have a soft landing place to rest. That's what a wrist support is for. You want your hips seated back in the back of the chair, your back well supported and that lumbar area uh, well supported. You want the chair to bend right in the small of your back. When you're seated you want to have your legs well supported and about a fist worth of distance between the front of your chair and the back of your leg. You want your legs uh, at a slight angle open 
and feet well supported either on the floor or on a foot support. The magic numbers for your elbows, hips, and knees should be somewhere in that 90 to 110 degree range. If we look at, for instance, a, an office setting with a computer, we're, we're using the computer longer than we've ever been on a daily basis. What you want to do is make sure your keyboard is within reach at a good keen angle. Your mouse is close to you and you're not reaching over to use your mouse and that you're in proper alignment, your head is straight on, you're viewing the monitors directly and you're not turning to, to the side when you look at the monitor. And um, making sure anything that you use quite often that it's within reach, within a safe zone, that you're not in a, any a kind of awkward position to reach or, or utilize those particular equipment. And just sit back in your chair so you do have good lumbar support and your feet is either properly supported on the ground or have foot rest so that you do sit back in your chair and be in a relaxed, comfortable position. Two common injuries in the workplace are usually the, uh, the back injury or cumulative trauma disorders. And oftentimes with back injuries, people associate to one episode or, or lifting uh, a, a huge load perhaps. But oftentimes uh, people associate a back injury with a pain rather than looking at the preventative end of it. There are other aspects to a back pain, but the other aspect is the employee awareness and how they do the job. because. Um, Oftentimes, people like to be as efficient as best to their ability, and by taking shortcuts or saving time, you know, carrying too many heavy items rather than going two separate, making two separate uh, trips, that would be one example. Another thing is that a lot of awkward movement or twisting, turning uh, movements that you're involved in, you want to try to minimize that. What people can do with applying ergonomics is looking at their own posture. Okay, if a person is uh, working at the computer and uh, under a deadline, the person may tend to lean forward uh, and press the keys much harder than normally would, get tense up, or feel that there's you know, not much time to get this task done. So um, I think subconsciously we think that by typing the keyboard much harder that we're doing the work faster, but indeed we know for sure that does, they don't correlate. There are a few things that people can uh, take control of during a, a course of your work where you're doing a lot of repetitive movement, perhaps uh, get up and do other things where you're not using the same muscle group. Take deep breaths. Oftentimes we, uh, we do a lot of shallow breathing. We really should do more breathing from our diaphragm and just take in more oxygen that replenishes the cell much quicker. And uh, doing stretches, overhead reaches perhaps. Um, just so that re you rejuvenate the cells as much as you can, get more oxygen into your body. Uh, there, and then, of course, outside work, there are other things you can do. Strengthen yourself, uh, be in good fitness condition, exercise, be active. And uh, taking yoga classes is a great thing for your back. We have fitness balls that uh, we usually uh, introduce people to that seem to work really well. It's always been used by physical therapists, and uh, of course, you know, when you use any kind of tools, you just want to make sure you consult with your physician and make sure that uh, you're able to do these exercises to the best of your ability. UCSD Environment Health and Safety has a uh, website on ergonomics, and it's under blank.ucsd.edu. And in the, uh, the site itself, it gives you a whole overview of our ergonomics program as well as what can you do for yourself uh, at a computer workstation, either at home or at work. How can you go uh, point by point, point uh, what to look for in doing an ergonomic assessment at the computer workstation. We also have PowerPoint presentations right now for laboratory ergonomics. People who are in the research arena would find that beneficial as to what kind of things they can do to minimize uh, repetitive movements and so on relating to a research area. And uh, we also have other resources available there in terms of uh, 
the check sheets and listing of resources or other organization that has really good uh, ergonomics program, as well as our training classes. We encourage UCSD employees to attend our ergonomics classes. So far we have three classes that's been offered periodically. One is on uh, office ergonomics that allows you to help yourself in setting up your workstation at home and at uh, work. And then we have the back safety. It's called how to maintain a healthy back. We talk about ver various risk factors relating to back and maintain a healthy back. And then, of course, the laboratory ergonomics. We also provide specialized courses, for instance, like in a mail services or, uh, for instance, for our groundskeepers and uh, physical plant services or dining and housing services. We have particular programs that are set up for those specialty groups. Coming up later on Conversations, UCSD arts students share their knowledge of the arts with school children. But now, Jeff Beta and Jim Cleves discuss the history and legacy of the Miller-Urey experiment 50 years later. 50 years ago, in the spring of 1953, the world experienced a breakthrough that would blaze a new pathway for science. In May, a young graduate student, Stanley Miller, published the results of a now famous experiment he conducted at the University of Chicago as a student of Harold Urey. What did he do that created the interest that continues to thrive today? As one of Stanley Miller's first graduate students, Jeffrey Beta, now professor of chemistry at UCSD's Scripps Institution of Oceanography, has an intimate perspective of this watershed in science and scientific thought. For nearly 40 years, he has pursued investigations into the origins of life, a field of science that the Miller-Urey experiment brought to the forefront a half century ago. In a recent article in the journal Science, Jeffrey and his colleague Antonio Rascano commemorated this event, the context in which it happened, and the context that it created. Well, there had been a lot of uh, work in the 19th century on this uh, synthesis of simple organic compounds, and it, this was driven primarily by the desire to understand how you could make uh, compounds uh, uh, that were known to be part of living organisms or whatever in the laboratory. And as far as uh, is known, none of these people really had an interest in the question of the origin of life or whether this chemistry might in fact be a, a associated with natural processes. And that really changed uh, in the 1920s when uh, Al Alexander Oparin, a Russian, and uh, Aldane, an Englishman, published uh, simultaneously almost a thought that uh, uh, organic compounds would have been made directly on the early earth by natural processes. These could have accumulated in the ocean making so-called prebiotic soup and from this prebiotic soup somehow uh, living entities appeared by just complicated chemistry. Uh, and that's sort of where the field stood uh, in the early 50s. Things changed in 1951 when Harold Urey presented a lecture about the chemical events associated with the origin of the solar system, where he suggested that the early atmosphere may have been a reducing atmosphere, containing methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. Stanley Miller was in the audience uh, for that lecture, and uh, a year or so later, he approached Urey about trying to mimic the early Earth using this reducing mixture. Uh, and uh, after some uh, uh, hesitation, Yuri finally agreed to do this uh, and sponsor this experiment, and all uh, well, the rest is kind of history. When uh, Stanley and Harold started thinking about the experimental design, one of the things they wanted to do was make this representative of the Earth's ocean atmosphere system. And so what they decided to do was have a flask that contained water, and this would be a, 
a mini ocean, if you want to think of it. And that was connected by a glass tube to another flask, a bigger flask, that would represent the atmosphere. And then there was another tube that took and connected the atmosphere flask back to the ocean. And if you think about how the ocean works, you get evaporation from the surface of the ocean, uh, the water condenses in the atmosphere, uh, falls on the continents so as this rain and precipitation, and that ends up washing back into the oceans. And so you have a, a cycle here. And so that experiment was designed to mimic that. So you took the water flask, you boiled it, that generated a water steam atmosphere. You introduce these reducing gases like hydrogen, methane, and ammonia, uh, and then you spark the mixture to simulate uh, lightning or coronal discharges. And then all of this stuff, uh, as it formed in the atmosphere, was washed back into the ocean where, in fact, the chemistry really took place. So all of the synthesis of amino acids in the Miller experiment takes place in the water flask. Uh, and so that's really telling us that the chemistry, if it took place on the Earth, would have taken place in the ocean. I think the remarkable thing about it, you look at the apparatus, it's a very simple design. It's designed to mimic the ocean atmosphere system on the Earth. And uh, it took them maybe a, a month or two to have the glass blower make this piece of apparatus. And uh, when Miller first set this up and ran it, he ran it for two days. And right away, he got a positive result. One of the things he noticed in the flask that was supposed to simulate the ocean was that he could detect the simplest amino acid, glycine. And when he showed these results to Yuri, Yuri was just incredulous. This was a fantastic result, just what he'd hoped for. And so uh, he had Miller repeat the experiment, this time running the experiment for a week. Uh, and uh, when Stanley analyzed the mixture at that point, he found that it contained uh, uh, several different amino acids, and, uh, uh, and he was able to identify four of these. Uh, and this really was a beautiful demonstration of how you could make simple organic compounds from a very simple simulated early Earth environment. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of these astounding results, Jeff, along with Jim Cleaves, who was Stanley's last graduate student here at UCSD, recreated the experiment under Stanley's supervision, attempting to replicate his original conditions as closely as possible. There were two goals in recreating the experiment. One was to demonstrate the simplicity of the experiment, which is one of the reasons it had such a remarkable impact. The other reason was to see if, using the more sophisticated analytical techniques that we have today, we could detect a wider range of products than Stanley was able to in 1953. The first step in, in recreating the experiment was to take the apparatus and put it under as great of a vacuum as we can get. And we'll close it off and leave it overnight to make sure it's not leaking. Because there's a slight danger that if you introduce oxygen into the apparatus, as it's filled with methane, which is natural gas, you can have an explosion when you spark it. So we want to make sure that it's absolutely airtight. Once we've done that, we introduce uh, about half a liter of water. It was double distilled water, so we know that the only compounds in there are going to be water and the gases. There are no contaminants or trace metals, anything like this. Once we have that, we put it under vacuum to release oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So once we make sure it's completely degassed water, we can start adding the gases sequentially. And what we do is we add measured volumes and pressures of hydrogen, methane, and ammonia until we have the complete system. And we close it off and cross our fingers when we start sparking it. What we use to generate the electricity is actually a Tesla coil, and it ge generates a high-frequency electric discharge that produces enough of an amperage to create radical reactions in the gas phase inside the spark discharge apparatus as the spark jumps between the two tungsten electrodes. One of the first things you see is a slight yellowish tint in the water as something is getting dissolved in there, organic compounds that are generated in the gas phase. And you also start to see little filaments of organic material coming off the electrodes that seem to be sticking and polymerizing in place. As time goes by, you suddenly see sputtering 
organic droplets appearing on the side and walls of the flask and a gradual buildup of a darkening color in the solution. So I think what happens is in the gas phase you have ammonia and methane recombining to form cyanide, hydrogen cyanide, and then you have uh, water vapor and methane recombining to give formaldehyde. And these compounds get condensed back into the water flask where they react in the aqueous phase. And it was determined fairly early after the experiment was first run that the mechanism of the amino acid synthesis is a reaction of an aldehyde with ammonia and cyanide that's then hydrolyzed to give an amino acid. But most of the chemistry does occur in the water phase. After the experiment was completed, Jim subjected the products to a modern analytical technique called high pressure liquid chromatography, or HPLC. Today, HPLC is pretty much the, one of the workhorses of analytical chemistry, that it's used for drug testing, it's used for medical diagnosis, environmental monitoring, and routinely in laboratory chemical preparation. When Stanley originally did the experiment, he could detect probably milligram quantities of amino acids. So that's 10 to the minus 3 grams, right? We can now detect probably about nine orders of magnitude greater. So 10 to the minus 12th milligrams of compound. This is a pretty good increase in sensitivity. One of the remarkable things we found is that there really is a very small product mixture that's very similar to the one that Stanley detected in 1953. And even though we can detect a lot of compounds at lower levels, those products that he detected are actually produced in such an excess that they stand out as the major products. So it's remarkable that his analysis was actually very accurate, especially given the techniques of the time. From one of his first graduate students to his last, Stanley's experiment has influenced generations, and it will continue to do so into the future. Well, if you look at the impact that uh, experiments had over the last 50 years, one of the things that just is uh, uh, amazing is the variety of organic compounds that have been made, the types of uh, environments that have been used to simulate the Earth and other planetary bodies, interstellar medium. It's really, really set the stage for a huge amount of work and trying to understand natural chemical reactions uh, in the universe. Uh, we now know that there's organic molecules around uh, in interstellar space. Uh, they're made by a variety of reactions. We know there's organic compounds on asteroids and meteorites. And all of this knowledge has contributed to helping us understand how this chemistry may have taken place on the early Earth, and it can all be traced back to the 1953 publication of the Miller-Urey experiment. Well, I think the, the Miller-Urey synthesis really stands as one of the touchstones of modern prebiotic chemistry. That even though some of the premises of the experiment are questioned now, the correlation of this experiment with really natural samples that we found on meteorites really suggests that this has some meaning, and it is really a process that takes place somewhere. And when we try to put together a narrative of how life began, we actually really do have a good sample of compounds that we know were probably available for the origin of life. And we found them 50 years ago. Finally tonight, UCSD Arts Bridge scholars who are bringing arts education to area public schools. Arts Bridge first started on, in UC Irvine, and it's a program where they take students who major in the arts, be it visual arts, theater, dance, music, and they take them into the community to work with um, students in the public school system who aren't exposed to arts, who don't get a chance to, um, either every day or at all, get a chance to work in the arts and to kind of see what they're about. My specific project that I'm working on with Amir is a theater project. It's basically all of our students are eighth graders with about 30 eighth graders. 
and they're all, uh, this is their first time working with drama and theater arts, and so our goal is to introduce the theater to the students and make it accessible to them so they don't, they don't think that it's, it's something that only the people on TV get to do, that they can really use it and um, feel like they can read plays and feel like they can, can go to the theater and um, it applies to their life. So our basic goal when we started working with the students was to get the students to start thinking about character development and how they can uh, develop their own characters and use their own personality to create these new characters. Well, it's being integrated in the projects that they're doing. It's taking it from simply writing and getting a grade and putting it in their portfolios to, hey, they're going to write it, they're going to think about it more, they're going to do it in a different way so that they can see that Learning doesn't always have to be the same way every single time. Right now, we just want to get them comfortable enough where they can write their um, write a short play um, in a group and then perform it, be it from a historical aspect or from basically any other aspect they want to, but to be able to sit down and write a play and feel comfortable and confident enough to go out and, and perform it for their peers, for their teachers, for their parents. We really wanted to get these students excited about theater and excited about performance. And so our goal was just to introduce it and give, introduce theater and give them the foundations that we felt they needed. Um, like what is a character? What are the different parts of the stage? Uh, what goes into creating a character? What goes into making a play? You know, what is dialogue? The basics, really foundations. And from there, we slowly, you know, without them even knowing it, we kind of tweak it and complicate it so that pretty soon they're, they're making their own plays. This is just a gradual process from working without script, getting more acting-wise, and then kind of involving the writing as well, and then the performance. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. yeah! Every day in our class, we start out with a warm-up, and um, we try to show the students how important a warm-up is. We do vocal warm-up and a physical warm-up, and we incorporate theater games, um, different ways to just get, what, what I told them is like every day we're gonna have little mini performances. So we'll usually stand in a circle and every student comes forward and, and makes a sound and movement, you know, getting their bodies warmed up, getting their voices warmed up. And that little moment, they're performing, whether or not they, they really think of it as a performance. And then from that point on, we'll go on to a little more difficult exercise, like something like freeze tag. No, I'll block you. much better. Freeze. Freeze? Someone else come in? So um, that kind of gets them creatively working and kind of gets them used to performing and being on stage in front of their peers. Every exercise is building on the next exercise. So we get them warmed up. We get them... Um, everybody moving so everybody participates so even the students who maybe in other classes can kind of sit back and you know they're shy and they, they don't want to participate we get them involved and we get everybody working together usually I was like real shy before like I mean I was just sit there like I'm not doing this but now I mean me and Bethany have helped out a lot and like just showing us how to do it I guess I wanted to get all the kids involved that was my main goal was to loosen up the class, to get them to feel comfortable with each other. And my main goal is, is to show them that books aren't just about the words on the page. If you want to learn how to think on your feet, you know, put somebody in front of 30 people and say, go, you know, and you, you, you know, of course, it's a little scary. And so, I mean, of course, that's not what we started with. We've progressed to that. It's getting me comfortable because, like, in our other classes, we're doing, like, um, act, we're doing drama too, like with our history and in our reading classes and stuff like that and like I'm becoming more like able to like it's easier for me to like to come up with the idea because like we do it a lot with Amir and Bethany and stuff like that so it's easier for me to come up with something like short and good and stuff like that. And just with these three lines we had completely different situations okay. Since the students know that we're that we're students right now that we're college students I think they I hope that they see us as kind of kind of role models, kind of mentors that they can ask us questions. You know, sometimes they'll ask us questions about college classes or about um, our performances. And I know they, they've said, oh, tell us when you're performing so we can come see you. And I mean, I think that's fun because then I think college becomes more accessible for them. And we'll say stop and we'll give you an emotion and then we'll clap and you hit a pose with that emotion, okay? Well, my role in the project is to 
help the kids be exposed to the arts. And in the way, if I can teach them about the arts, something that they remember, that would be great. When the kids know that this is not just some guy who just wants to come and teach theater, but that actually he's involved with it, and after college he will be involved with it for the rest of his life, that helps a lot because they respect you more and they know that you're serious about your craft and that you're not just kind of just coming in, just preaching to them. I think that the, the classroom teacher is so important in the process, in the ArtsBridge process, because the teacher knows the students. The teacher works with the students every day. And so it was really important for us to meet with, with the teacher beforehand and let him just talk to, talk to us about his students and, and kind of give us an idea of, of where they're at and, you know, what students, um, what they've been working on and what he, the growth he's seen since he's had them. There's always supposed to be a teacher involved and in the room at all times. Um, in that way, I'm also able to help the teachers learn about different ways to approach the arts with their kids so that once we leave, they would be able to um, teach their kids just about the arts in general so that they get, they get something from it as well. I'm getting a lot of interaction with students that I didn't think were going to participate. They're really starting to step forward, which I'm a little interested to see you know, their reactions to them. When you're in a classroom, normally they're very quiet and timid and all of a sudden they're on stage and they're a whole different person. I think that it's, it's great to collaborate in the process because we definitely want to work with the teacher so that the teacher can feel like the work that they're doing outside is supported by the Arts Bridge program. And so kind of bringing, bringing those two together. I've seen their comprehension increase, but I've also just emotionally seen them increase their understanding of people in books and in writing. There is a more connection because now they're seeing hey, those aren't just people in a book, they're actual real people, or they're people that the character or the author really wanted to present in a certain way. So they're getting different perspectives. When we're reading and we're supposed to like, get the emotions of people, I feel like I can understand what they're feeling and what they're going through because of this. Just help me out. We'll probably be working on this um, character work with the scenes for the next week or two, um, just so they can actually grasp the idea of, of getting into a group and working together as a team to come up with a scene um, all together and involving everyone and really being, being clear on their objectives. It's actually a lot to ask for an eighth grader to do. I like working in groups because it's because it's funner because like people like you'll have an idea and if somebody else has a better idea you know you kind of like oh yeah that works better. From our, any other classes like you go in you sit down you do your work and then like you talk get in trouble and then like whatever and like you just stay in there for like the 45 minutes or whatever and then you go to the next class but in here you like you get to act out you get to be yourself and stuff like that and like you, you just get to express your feelings like in like your little acts or something. My personal goals are just I think that every time I see the students getting excited about the arts, it just reinforces my passion for it. I definitely want to continue working in the schools because it's definitely been an opportunity for me to, to kind of remember why I'm, why I'm studying theater, why I'm studying dance, because it's exciting, because it applies to your life, because it's a wonderful like release, because it's something new and it's challenging every time you do it. Every time you do it, you learn something new. It opened my, opened my eyes to teaching as well, because I always thought, you know, I'm going to be an actor, I'm just going to work in um, the stage and TV and, and try to get jobs. But now I'm thinking I actually might want to go to grad school and get an MFA degree and actually go and teach. Because it, it's, it's another um, aspect of like happiness that you get, fulfillment. Um, teaching, bringing your art that you enjoy to do to other, stu to other kids who haven't been exposed to it and getting them to kind of enjoy it and become interested in it. It's a whole nother fulfillment. Karate instructor. <laughs> getting the teacher involved and making sure that he or she is in the classroom and involved with the students kind of goes beyond that. It helps this teacher as well know how to work with the students in the arts so that once we're gone, it can continue. It doesn't just stop there. The students will still be exposed once in a while with the teacher's knowledge to the arts. I think that we wanted the students to be able to, we want them to understand kind of how the arts can fit into their life. I mean, ideally, ideally every school would have an arts program that gets adequate funding, that has uh, teachers who really care about the arts. I mean, that's, that's ideal, but 
since a lot of the schools don't have those type of programs or a lot of those the funding has been cut for that I think that it's a really unique opportunity for for uh, older students who really care about the arts and who have been able to study the arts the to come in and and create a space where the arts still the arts still lives the arts are still um, are still alive are still there for the students to access I just think that this is one of the aspects that all kids need all kids at all grade levels working together learning different things about the arts it, it's a fantastic way of learning and it's one that all kids should have an opportunity to have so I just appreciate having them come in I actually was shocked about how little the arts are focused on in the school curriculum um, just starting in elementary school I mean starting from first grade on through eighth grade all the general subjects are always covered but the arts are somehow just completely left out and sometimes it's great to just see the faces of the kids just being exposed to arts and just kind of singing or dancing or or acting or just being exposed to them they just it lights up their eyes and it's just it's a great experience because it's just something that they need and they're lacking and just to provide it to them it, they just are just so happy to get it. Whether or not you choose to, to go audition for the play, your school play, the point is, at some point, you're gonna, the arts, the arts can help you in ways that we, we can't even imagine. Ta-da!